Excellent. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sandy, for joining us today at the Harassis America 2022 event. There's so much uh, to talk about with you. I mean, you're you're just such a busy guy. I, I don't even know how to introduce you, and I've done it three or four times at this point. Um, our topic today is for the audience to know is unveiling shared opportunities in America's future the convergence of human spirit and technology. And we lost Sandy due to technical uh, issues, but he will pop back in. While he has stepped away, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Cynthia Johnson. I'm co-founder and CEO of Bell and Ivy, and we are a personal and employee branding agency working in the, primarily the tech and healthcare space. Oh, hello. is this Rhonda? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Rhonda and Rhonda Jones. Rhonda, it's so great to uh, to connect. Likewise. I was just introducing myself and Sandy Kleiman had some technical difficulties, so he'll be jumping on the next few minutes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, introducing the topic, introducing the, the panelists. So again, I'm Cynthia Johnson, uh, co-founder of an agency in Santa Monica. I also wrote a book about personal branding uh, and bringing a voice to organizations through its people. Uh, my... My experience with Harassus goes back three or four years, uh, and the way I typically like to run my panels as a moderator uh, is to pass the mic over to our speakers and our panelists and have them introduce themselves because, well, they're just better at it. <laughs> a lot of complex careers here. Uh, so while Sandy is away, uh, Rhonda, sure. I would love to uh, have you introduce yourself. Sure. So hi, everyone. Great to be with you. I'm Rhonda Fami. I'm an attorney based in Washington, D.C. I've been here for about 30 plus years, um, had a long career in law and politics. But about five years ago, I decided to pursue the American dream. And that, of course, is being an entrepreneur. I started my own beauty brand called Makeup America. It's focused on made in America and educating the American public about why it's so important um, to have made in America products, especially in this day and age of divisions and interest in health and safety and job creation. So I'm really glad to be with you today and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, thank you. It's so great to have a female founder in the room. And Sandy, welcome back. You know, we're going to apologize right now. So as I was discussing with Cynthia, that at the beginning, so I'm in this house that is, again, more information than anyone needs. This is a post-divorce life. And I covered an outside patio for what was a closet because it had these 1950s sort of, you know, waterlogged, held maybe one suit, you know, mirrored 1950s closet. So I built this and I said, I'm going to put my office in here because it's large enough to do that. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and all of a sudden we needed cameras. And unfortunately, the office that is now set up and the guest house where the computer just crashed were the other alternatives, which would have been so much more professional because at the beginning of the pandemic, I would take meetings from this room and people would say, wow, we actually see you have one color blazer and, you know, just khaki and gray pants. And, and I still have people say, you're taking meetings from the closet. Unfortunately, <laughs> run the world. I am taking a meeting from the closet. So we are here. I didn't have time to clean it up. You can see the boys in the background, and we will talk about unveiling the shared opportunities for America's future in what is probably the place that is best suited for that, <laughs> where you get dressed in the morning. <laughs> oh, that is, uh, that is so true. There are probably a lot of people taking calls in the closet this day, so you really represent Sam the Sam Blasenberg is here. He's going like, to put this on freaking Facebook. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's great. Uh, Sandy, uh, you, Rhonda just introduced herself, uh, and I know you've, you've you know, read her bio as well, so you've got an idea of who she is. I'd love for you to introduce yourself so we can jump right into the panel. Well, it's an honor to be here with both of you, but I also think creating the kind of beauty brand that you are, are doing is, is really quite important. Thanks. It's entrepreneurship at its core. And, you know, look, my life runs between entertainment, finance, global business, venture capital. And these days, and this is what I was talking with Cynthia about when we were talking about earlier, um, what 
those opportunities for not just America's future, but the world's future is about is actually to follow in the steps of entrepreneurial beauty. It is to prepare people, to prepare the next generation for STEM careers, for careers that basically, since we know technology and science touch almost every vertical in our economy, and we know there's a huge skills gap, I really have only two ways to give back that I can see, or at least I try. One is cross-cultural storytelling, because I believe people are the same all over the world. And that, particularly now, we would never have foreseen the kind of global conflict we're in potentially right now, even more so. The sense is that we have to we have to understand that the aspirations of people for their families, no matter what country I visit anywhere in the world, is a better life. A, a, a sense that you can provide for your family, enjoy time with your community, build a better life. And how do you do that? Through education. So we are launching any number of online schools. Um, the one that we will be launching shortly, which is focused on really closing the skills gap between the 60% of tech and science jobs that will go unfilled and the, the next generation is to sort of create those opportunities earlier rather than later, which we can talk about. But I'm just thrilled everyone is here. I suspect everyone who is on this particular panel is, is dedicated at a time when it's absolutely critical to improve the state of the world and the state of life on our planet. Oh, that's uh, perfectly beautifully said, uh, and it, I'm very excited to to get started. What what I'm doing? I've actually spent a, quite a bit of time looking up the two of you, and you really, you could speak to this on so many levels. I I'd love to start actually, Rhonda, because you're you came to me and you said I want to talk about educating people of the about the importance of made in America. Mm -hmm. uh, one, does that also mean higher in America? And two, what what are the key you know bullet points of the importance of being made in America? Sure. So if I may, if I could just start with the title of this, which is unveiling shared opportunities for America's future. And if you know, being the political geek that I am, if any of you happen to watch the State of the Union address on Tuesday night, there were two subject matters that got bipartisan approval. One, of course, was Ukraine. I don't think there's anybody on either side of the aisle that disagrees with our support for Ukraine. But the other one that got such applause is made in America. When President Biden talked about that, he talked about the importance of it. So let's start with that. It's a bipartisan issue. It's something that could bring all Americans together. And there's no question, America is very divided right now, especially politically. So why Made in America? Let's start with number one, bringing our manufacturing base back to America so that we could have real jobs. And what do I mean by real jobs? Jobs that pay more than, you know, basic uh, living wage. It has got to be above that living wage. It's got to provide good jobs. And we sent those jobs away 30, 40 years ago when I first got to Washington. We have to bring those back for jobs, both men and women and everybody in America. So it's going to improve the economy if we do that. The second reason, most certainly, and we should have learned this during COVID, is health and safety reasons. So while goods that come from abroad aren't necessarily regulated, and if they are, sometimes they don't tell the truth. Let's take the beauty industry. Cosmetics are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Most cosmetics that American women are using, and men in the men's grooming line area, are made abroad. Sometimes they're made in countries that test on animals, that use lead in their ingredients, that use child labor to manufacture it. And so you can't guarantee the health and safety of what you're putting on your face, what your skin is absorbing, frankly, if you don't know where it's coming from. So the importance of Made in America goes to health and safety. And finally, of course, Made in America, of course, will, um, you know, bring together both large corporations and small businesses. Everybody got together and made a pledge and said, 
We're only going to sell goods made in America from the big giant Amazon to the small mom and pop store. Again, the benefits would come back to all of us in the form of economic benefits, job creation, health and safety. Um, and, you know, frankly, pride. I, I've traveled the world, too. And I can tell you, hands down, we've got, you know, we've got our faults in America, but we are the best country on this earth. And we should lead. And leading means buying and making our own products. Yeah, well, I know when I when uh, speaking with Sandy about this, you also agree the, the living wage is a huge, there's a number out there that makes all the difference in someone's lives and their family lives. And you know, Rhonda, you're talking about the importance of Made in America for safety and health. But if we are saying or the unveiling or the convergence of human spirit and technology to use it to educate people, who are we, who are we speaking about? Is it, is it moms and dads who need to make it? Is it business owners? Is it, when we start with the kids, do they need to know first? Are you asking me? I'm asking both of you. Because yeah. I know, yeah. Well, I would just say, and I'll tee it off to Sandy. Um, you know, I would say it's everybody. So we could start with K through 12 um, and teaching the kids about that whether it's an economics, a business lesson. Um, I don't know. I learned American history and patriotism when I was in grade school, you know, a civics lesson about it. Right. And of course, um, you know, the adults can learn. The adults are easily learning about this if we can just educate them in the right forum. Um, and then, of course, the businesses. And there's lots of coalitions in Washington that are working towards this and educating businesses and bringing businesses together so that we can focus on this goal itself. And I'll tee it off to Sandy for that, for the education part. Well, again, let, let me just address education in, in two, two different verticals that I that relate to this conversation. One is critical thinking and the other is preparation for a life in a hopefully in a career that engages you and and inspires you. And so let's start with critical thinking and Rhonda said, well, I'm not sure I would phrase it exactly as she has as why made in America. I think what we need is to have in America and inculcated in our partners and our suppliers around the world values and critical thinking. You know, if if you if you really care about what is going through beauty products into your body, onto your face, then you, you should know how to explore and research and understand the difference of brands. One of the things that I appreciate most about whether it's Gen Z or whatever the youngest generation you can name is, is that they actually um, look for products with stories and they should authenticate those stories. Mm -hmm. They should understand we not everything will be made in America. Again, it's you know, the, the reality is we're living in a global community. And, and what we're seeing right now in the U.S. and outside the U.S. is the splintering and the, the lack of collaboration about that globality and about that set of shared aspirations and values. And we do need to bring that together. But putting aside the geopolitical issues on a common sense, we need to train people. We need to help people understand how to search for the truth, whether that's the truth in ingredients or the truth in the news, either one. And I don't, you know something? I'm in a closet. You got a dog. This is the greatest panel. Cynthia, you gotta, you, I, I want your rabbit to show up in a minute. It's my COVID. <laughs> this is like, you know, it's as if we're drinking while we're doing the panel. But then we have the other side which is, you know, we took a page out of Nike. So Nike will go to the, to the inner city basketball court and look for talent at a very young age. I, I think that what we have done, and, you know, I'm very fortunate, but I am of another generation. So when I graduated an Ivy League university, it was almost a guarantee that there was a career out there for you. And a general education was a path to the next phase of apprenticeship. And the reality is that's no longer the case. You know, the, Google is bypassing. They're saying, just come to us and we'll train you. And the world, whether it's, you know, in our digital economy and whether it's, you know, anything we're doing is digitally enabled right now. I mean, if you're in a restaurant, it's digitally enabled. You're working off of open table. You have 
you know, your car, if you're, you know, one of my friends is the CEO of Snap-on, which makes the most um, professional tools in the world. They serve a million people, whether they are working for the company or in a distributed world of, you know, garages and others with extraordinary pride. These are the, they don't sell tools to, you know, me at home. They sell tools to professionals. And I said to him one day, I said, and, and how is the technology side of your business? He said, very deep. He said, cars are computers. He said, everything we touch is digitally enabled. So it's not that you're working with a wrench. You're working through technology with tools. And everything is that way today. And so what we're going to do is launch a school of STEM in partnership with a major education company, the largest uh, scientific publisher in the world, as well as one of the groups that deals most intimately with the hiring needs of not the Fortune 500, but the, the place where 90% of workers work, which are the companies that are not the true Googles, Microsofts, who can afford to do their own programs. It's those that really want through internship, apprenticeship, and early identification. They will want to recruit their next generation of, you know, skilled workers. Mm -hmm. And frankly, at the end of the day, what we want is for young people to have the opportunity to look not academically, but practically alongside mm -hmm. academics and say, this inspires me, but I can make a living at it. And then give them the tools, the knowledge, the experience and the certification that gives them a leg up so that whether it's your family, your community, any number of different metrics, your life and the lives of those around you will be changed for the better. You know, I want to pick up on that, if I might, Cynthia. Yeah. That, that term, um, Sandy, often I'm asked when I pitch investors, you know, who's your target consumer client? Or who's your target consumer? And I often say there's a word for that, and that's conscious consumer. You know, my consumer and my target client is a conscious consumer who aligns her purchases with her values. And that's what a lot of this newer, younger generation are doing, exactly what you said. And the term for that is conscious consumerism. Yeah. You know, thinking about the, the concept of conscious consumerism and then the STEM programs, uh, what something that comes to my mind are, are two things, really. Uh, one, we... Our agency ran an, an employee branding campaign with Walmart right at the start of the pandemic. And they actually were holding, they turned their back rooms into education centers for teachers locally because teachers didn't know how to use Zoom. And now they're, they're teaching with the same tool they don't understand to a, a classroom full of kids at home who don't, who don't understand. So uh, that the question is, would everyone be or the majority be a conscious consumer if they understood what that meant? Uh, and the second thing is access. So uh, it's great to have these educational programs, but if these kids don't have a laptop or they don't have a, a device, then what? So I'm curious uh, from from your perspective, you know, how do you how do you take these STEM programs or these ideas and and put them out at scale if there are issues like. I don't have a laptop or I don't know how to use Zoom. Is that for Sandy or me? Sandy? Sandy. Yep. Well, look, I mean, let's talk about, you know, there's the digital divide, which is what you're addressing in terms of lack of access. And that will have to come with philanthropy. But I'll tell you this, you know, it's funny. Um, religious institutions, which step into the lives of people who have nothing. And I remember listening to the head of Midnight Mission speak about the issue of the digital divide. And he had a woman who was completely indigent. And, you know, so what would they normally do? If it were 30 years ago, they'd make sure she had food and shelter. And she said, you know, I also need cable television and a cell phone. And the Midnight Mission went deep into its thought process and talked to other religious leaders about this. And they said, you know something? What we're dealing with are the basics of life, and the basics of life now include entertainment and connectivity. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that we have to make sure everyone has access to, entertain, to, to connectivity and entertainment will come the way it comes. But I think that um, the, the, the more pronounced problem is not the digital divide, because you can fill that with financial commitments, whether governmental or philanthropic. But then you need to inspire. And it's, you know, when you look at Masterclass or Udemy or any of these, you know, new additions to lifelong education, what you're seeing is the early glimmer of something that we all know is coming. We used to think of education as medicine. Just do it. You don't have to like it, but learn. The reality is you have to like learning because we don't have an end goal, high school, college, master's degrees, PhD, medical, professional, attorney. What we have is things are moving in our world so quickly that lifelong learning is what you have to participate in. And consequently, you have to enjoy learning. And we have to use all the tools that we have, you know, studied in entertainment, in education, in any number of different engagements. And it could be for healthcare, it could be for your professional career. Ultimately, it's why gaming is such an important part of the future. Because when people learn in a non-agrarian way, you know, we, you know, in the 19th century, we invented the education system that I went through, which is you get the summer off, we do it so you can work on the farm and, you know, you basically study stuff and you have a test at the end and you forget after the test what you learned. We are now reinventing what it means to have education that inspires education that allows you to be inquisitive and engaged, and education that is a daily stepping stone to more education. And what we're going to do a lot, you know, it, there's a thought that, you know, half the colleges in this country could close in the next 10 years because to spend $400,000 and be a waiter is not a good economic deal. And yet we know that if you have a basic, and I mean basic education in computer programming, which is not the only area that needs to be addressed. You know, the starting salaries at, you know, the good the, that Facebook or Meta or the big companies, $140,000 at the lesser companies, $180,000. The reality is that we need to get people, whether they are working for, you know, a Walmart, Best Buy, Ford, or Google, we want to put them on a path where their contributions are properly rewarded and that they have an inspiration as to why they go to work every day. Inspiration. Both, both of you inspire people. I would take this a little personal for a second since we, so I have your time. <laughs> and I'm but, in the closet. Now. And what you're in the closet. I would have shot you. Than being in the closet. I've got or having a dog in your lap while you're on a panel. <laughs> Look at <laughs> um, No, I'm, I'm curious and, you know, maybe we can start with uh, whoever, whomever has the uh, answer first, but what, what are, or, or who inspires you in your work? Yeah. You know, I would have to say um, my both my parents, for sure. So my parents are immigrants from the Middle East. They came here in the 1950s to get a master's and doctor degree in education. And they were supposed to go back to their respective countries and teach. And they didn't. And they didn't because America was the greatest country in the world in the 1950s. And they decided to stay here and get married and have kids and my parents always believed in America and they always believed in the American dream and they lived it every day and they taught me. And I always say, I always had that special appreciation, maybe more so than anybody born here of the American dream. I know I saw the countries they came from. I visited there every summer. I saw my relatives and I was always thankful, thankful to be in America. And that inspired my interest in politics and the law. And ultimately, as I say, the ultimate American dream is being an entrepreneur. And so, you know, my, even though my dad did pass a couple of years ago, best man I ever knew, um, my mom, God, God bless, still alive at 90, uh, living the good life in California. Um, they inspire me every day because they went through d adversity. They went through a lot of difficulty, but yet they still made it. And I'm inspired to work through adversity every day because of them. 
And, you know, I really, I, I'm inspired to make this country better. That's why I went into public service. That's why I worked for President Bush. That's why I worked for a United States Senator. That's why I volunteer on campaigns and I vote in every single election, primaries in general. You know, I'm there. So um, to me, that's what keeps, that's what keeps me ticking. That's beautiful. That's yeah, no, that's that's such a your parents being your your inspiration. Absolutely. You know, I, I you know, I look, I grew up in the Northeast Bronx. So all of this is a fantasy. <laughs> and, you know, whether your parents and where they came from looked at the U.S. as I still think America is the greatest country on Earth. And I think that the I am inspired not just by, you know, the people here in the American spirit, but by the people I see around the world. I, you know, look, I, you know, I, I have the blessing of a crazy life. People pitch me ideas all day. I deal with people with, um, you know, you know, bringing forward the future. And a lot of them are young. I mean, you know, I, 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 I kind of just forget my age every day. I just it, it's kind of irrelevant to what I do. And, you know, we got one business where they can take um, instead of aging a scotch for 30 years in a barrel, they can do it in a week with algorithms and technology and beat the 30 year old scotch that I'm not sure is going to change the world for the better. But it certainly will enhance the supply of ready to drink alcoholic (laughs) beverages. But in any event, the bottom line is it is the enthusiasm, the innovation. And I'll tell you what really inspires me is I, I believe people essentially are good. In this divisive world, no matter where I am, I actually marvel at the random acts of kindness, at the sense of how people extend themselves for others, at the sense of compassion. And while it is, you know, we, we talk a lot about that not being evident and being in a scarcer supply than it has been, it's still at the core of who we are. And every time I see that, it reminds me, A, of the people who've helped me get beyond where I started and what it means to pay it forward. Yeah, it's so, speaking to both of you, because I've never, I haven't met either of you in person. So the technology is enabling this this conversation here. But I, I will say it's really in, it is really inspiring to hear stories like both of yours where you've had these epic careers by almost anyone's standard and then did something else anyway to start all over again and and be, be- the best of something else. And this, this uh, I don't know if it's energy or fearlessness or endless curiosity that drives people like you to do this and end up in conversations on Zoom. Uh, but I personally feel, you know, when you're talking about education, we're talking about trying to inspire people to want to learn. We need to hear more from, from you um, and, and, and the younger, the teachers and really at every, at every level. And uh, I wonder through whether your STEM education or the work that you're doing uh, to reach that conscious consumer or convert to a conscious consumer are, are, is it, is it a, like, who are the people that we be listening to every day? And do you know more of them? Can we get them on panels like this or in front of our kids? Yeah. Yeah, for certain. I mean, I'm, you know, a member of a board um, called Coalition for Prosperous America. I'm also on the board of MadeInAmerica.org. And these people are dedicated to educating people and working with policymakers, lawmakers, and others to make sure we understand what the benefits of Made in America are. So I'm happy to offer up my colleagues' names, you know, for more. This is such a great forum. I always enjoy participating in it. Frank's a real powerhouse, as everybody knows him. So I'm very happy to to add more. More is more here. So, You know, I'll, I'll give you a couple of vantage points here. Firstly, when you talk about Made in America and the importance of Made in America, I think you have to extend that. The reason it's not about the importance of made in America. It's the importance of why you think made in America is important. And then how can we transfer that value system everywhere? Yeah. So that made in America should mean something very special, but we should then be happy when made elsewhere is as important as made in America. 
it's you know that that the goal is to spread the the values now in my case you know look i mean i personally think people should be listening to their spouses their children the people in their community the people they work with because you can work with somebody and never hear them and never see them and you know one of the things and i sort of had to train myself to do this is a kind word and a positive emotion can change everything for someone. Most people have very little of that in their lives. And whether it's your, you know, your family and understanding what's important to them, it's not what's important to you. That is important, but it's what's important to others. And then how you can support them in the world that is challenging them every day. And it makes a world difference. I mean, I'll give you one quick example. I grew up in the Northeast Bronx. Neither parent went to college. And the Bronx was not a fun place even back then. And probably it's gentrified more than, 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 than when I lived there. And I went to P78 and IS-144, and I had applied to the Bronx High School of Science and gotten in, which is your ticket out of the Bronx. But I got a letter saying I had to do a, 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 a research project. And I misread it. I realized it was junior year, but I thought it was like then. And I took the number nine bus down East Chester Road to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. My mom was a ward clerk at Bronx Municipal, where gunshots were the norm in the emergency room. And 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 I walked in. There was no security back then. I walked into the sciences building. I walked up to the first floor that wasn't the lobby, which was the neurology department. I walked into the office of Dr. William T. Norton, a bearded, bespeckled, pipe-smoking professor from Maine who basically was one of the world's leading experts in the structure of the myelin sheath. And what you need to inculcate is, I don't know how I did, I just sort of said, do you mind if I hung out here? So six years of neurochemical research in those labs, you know, gets you into Harvard and gets you into the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Business School. And if it were not for Dr. Norton, there would be no me on this call right now. And we all need to not worry about the thousands we can influence. It's the handful where we can really make a difference. Right. Yeah. The, the, that, uh, that's, there's no truer statement probably from this entire call. Like that one, I have one teacher that made the big difference in my life. It was like eighth grade. Um, and I, I, I hear, hear that from, from both of you being inspired by people very close to you uh, with, well, let's talk about the use of technology since now we don't, you know, we could sit in front of thousands of people on a Zoom call and that, that's possible, uh, but we typically don't. It's, it's these group calls. Uh, and are there ways that we can sort of narrow down to smaller groups and find these group leaders and have these one-on-one -on -one conversations in a new way? Because it's not as easy to walk into a hospital anymore and walk into that guy's office. Well, the thing that I think is important, and Zoom is tough because when you're with someone, you can engage in a certain way. And these sorts of, even our business meetings, we were talking about this last night at dinner when real human beings sat at a real restaurant together, is that you often don't get into the sort of intimacy of conversation you do in person. But what I would say in general, and Rhonda's got a thousand touch points to do this because of the business she's in, and so do you, Cynthia, is is always ask always invite people to engage and that's where technology actually you just have to remember to sort of listen carefully and then invite the engagement and generally one-on-one -on -one. and if you actually are sincere about it it can make all the world a difference Rhonda, have you experienced that in in the conscious consumer days yeah, you know, are you having these one-on-ones? Yeah, well, I'll tell you a great example, you know, in the beauty business is you're absolutely right. It's so hard for people to touch and feel and look at the product. And how does it look on me? What color? I get so many, you know, a lot of outreach by my customers. What is that pink? You know, what does that look like? And, you know, how, you know, how deep is that color? When I'm actually at trade shows or pop-up venues where they can touch and feel the makeup, the beauty brand and interact with me. I'm the founder and I can explain to them, you know, what's in it, how it looks, you know, how to apply it. Um, it's a sale. It's an instant sale, right? So my experience in that industry 
It's a very, very hands-on, one-on-one personal. It is very hard to buy cosmetics online. I will tell you that unless you've used the same brand over and over. But seeing the new colors and feeling it and seeing how it looks on you is very, very important. But I want to ask Rhonda a question on that. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you know, you touch people who then interact with people about very personal aspects of their lives. Mm -hmm. And the, the sense of making people comfortable, how do you, you know, how do you, I know, I see you do this, but how do you inculcate the sense of extending a sense of self-confidence and comfort because you are at the core of where people are insecure? Yeah. And, you know, beauty is a very emotional thing for people. It's an emotional purchase. So when they're buying, you know, what did they say? I think it was World War II when, you know, the economy was in the dumps coming out of the depression. And, you know, what were people buying? Red lipstick, because red lipstick made them feel better. It's a very emotional purchase. Um, And how do you make them feel? Answer to your question is you do engage them. You compliment them. You tell them that they are beautiful. They have beautiful lips or beautiful eyes or how one color might enhance what they already have. Um, And so it's that approach. Also, I was on a call the other day with about 100 women up in New Hampshire, and um, they asked me, what's your best makeup tip? And I said, for anybody and anyone, you don't put any makeup on, you're on a Zoom call, the last minute, just put a swipe of red lipstick on. You would be surprised (laughs) what red lipstick does for your inner soul and for your (laughs) On a Zoom call. And, uh, uh, needless to say, a lot of that independence red lipstick went flying out the door. So, well, yeah. Yeah. so well, Cynthia, we have about eight minutes left. Should we open it up uh, to questions at some point? Yeah, absolutely. We've had people uh, coming in and out of the room, which is very typical of, of this event. And uh, right now it's uh, Kimball Andrews. And if he, let's see if we have... Uh, Oh, so, so far, what we have is Sandy Kleiman, you're looking good. <laughs> you know something? Just, we can go, I can go change this jacket right now. People no. can vote. We can make this an interactive <laughs> session. <laughs> sure. So, let's, oh, yeah, floor is open to questions. Uh, there's a comment section to uh, the right of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there and, and we'll uh, answer them. As we go, uh, and I'll repeat that as more people come in and out of the room. Uh, now, I, now I feel like I need red lipstick. You're very good at what you do. Um, so I'm like, where's my red lipstick? Thank you. You, you <laughs> should just, you should just feel completely comfortable that the balance between red lipstick and a more natural look, it's they are just choices. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I, I, no, I appreciate appreciate that. Uh, so, okay, so where we are, we're hitting the last seven minutes until we get more questions. We'll just keep we'll just keep uh, moving forward. So, something both of you emailed me that you wanted to touch on, and we did a little bit in the beginning was preparing the next generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, that goes back to these the youth. If if we, if we can't get on your STEM classes or the new education program, or we don't get to hear from you, Rhonda, you know, about conscious consumerism, uh, what are some ways parents, teachers, leaders of, of organizations can help inspire uh, the new generation to be those, those critical thinkers and curious people we're, we're after? Yeah. I mean, what I've seen, certainly, you know, I have a 24 year old daughter and she was raised much differently than I was. Um, I learn every day from her about technology and I learned when she was young. And I just think that we all come to accept that technology may be our new teacher in that sense. And so these kids, while we try to teach them what to do, they're exposed to so much right? Whether they're on, back then it was, you know, with her, it was a laptop. Now it's like these kids, babies have iPads, right? And so, you know, we have to, I think, accept that doesn't take the place of human learning and learning from your parents or your community uh, or somebody who is a mentor in your career. But the reality is they're learning stuff, good and bad, online, 
Okay. And so how do we go onto that platform and participate in that platform to help teach them what we care about? And that's really critical. Um, and, you know, you see it. It's a very fast moving industry. I mean, TikTok wasn't around a few years ago. Right. I mean, before that, I remember all the other technology and, you know, sites my daughter would go on. It's just it, it moves so quickly and we have to be prepared for that. Um, you know, also in a way too. you know, one cool way to kind of get these young kids involved is they love their phones. And so, you know, what I'm, you know, trying to connect with is folks that want to develop an app, you know, because they love their apps, right, where there's a scanner on the phone, and you can scan anything you're buying, and you can immediately see where it's made. Okay, how fun is that? Oh, where's that made? Where's that made? Where's that made when they're shopping? So they can make their decision. They're a conscious consumer, and they don't want to buy anything that's not made in America, they can do it on their phone, right? So, um, so that's where, you know, that's where I think we could bring sort of the youth in and technology rolling into this. Well, you know, for me, you know, you're asking probably one of the most essential questions, and I'm not sure it's entirely about technology. Technology creates a, a complexity around our world that, you know, is just another added layer that is a challenge as well as a support. But I, I think we've got, as we talked about before, life and we've got career skills, and that's preparing you for how you actually support yourself, your family, your community, whatever it is. There are life skills as well. And we need to actually do a better job on life skills. And the one that, you know, is most pressing right now, I think, is mental health. We had a mental health challenges um, created by any number of different factors before the pandemic. And all the pandemic did was ramp the mental health challenges up beyond anything we could have ever imagined. And I think that the the sense of, how technology, fear of missing out, social media, the sense that um, you're, you know, whether you belong, whether you're unworthy, whether you have to lead your life. I used to say we, you, that people led their lives as if they were in a movie. Now I say they're leading their lives as if they're in a game. And you have to have a bored ape or you have to have a crypto punk whose valuations are dropping right now. Or, you know, did I buy Bitcoin or did I do this? Have I Robin Hooded? Have I meme stocked something? Have I done a thousand different things? But putting aside all those activities, they point back at one place was how you see yourself. And we have to get back to a sense where you can decouple from constantly evaluating whether you're living up to your own expectations. And, you know, honestly, each of us, you know, we think about cosmic things we can do. These are daily and hourly things we can do, which is to remind people that they are loved, they are worthy, they are a part of a community, they add value, they, 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 should, be, they should be happy with the achievements in their life, and yes, people who are having a very difficult time, whether it's health or business or relationship wise, be there for them, but be there for them in the right ways. Because ultimately, we are a social species and we can use that for better or for worse. We're watching how it's being used for worse right now in Ukraine. And we need to simply do better everywhere and starting at home. Yes. And, and to the tail end of what you said, it's we, we forget the technology is, a, is just a tool. It's another way for us to communicate. But communication is at its core, whether it's a phone or a laptop or whatnot. And you're, you should be reaching out to people who need us and, and asking the right questions, which is usually, how are you? Do you need anything? Do you want to go to lunch? Um, it's, it's amazing. We have these these conversations about expanding technology and really it's more about human spirit every single time because the new well, generation is going to create something else. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, the, 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 the summation of that is, is this for me, exactly what you're saying is when I was brought up, we were always in, you know, what we were encouraged to ask, what can we do for you? And technology never asks that deep down in technology is what can you do for the technology, no matter how the question is phrased, it comes back to what you can do for them. Yeah. And we need to ask what can, 
We need to extend ourselves, and that's what needs to happen. I couldn't agree more. And we, we're at time, so I'll, I just want to say thank you to both of you for being here and sharing your wisdom and, uh, and thoughts and ideas. And I hope to connect with you in the real world very soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, Sandy. Nice to meet you. You've been great. All right. Out of the closet. You got it. Bye. Bye.